Good morning, colleagues, uh, students and guests. It's 10 o'clock and I think we can start. Um, yes, welcome to our fifth talk um, in our in our series, um, in our lecture series. Um, today's talk is by Mpeti Murjele. I'm Ludwig Hansen, and together with Kiki Durman, oversee the uh, honors program uh, of which this lecture series forms a part. Um, the lectures to date have given us insight uh, on the methodologies and approaches towards solving spatial challenges in our built environment, as well as the nature of exchange of ideas to achieve uh, architectural and spatial excellence. And I know that today's installment will greatly expand on that discourse. Uh, before I introduce Mpeti, uh, some announcements. Um, the lecture series is also accredited um, with SACAP um, CPD points. And on the screen uh, is displayed the link for uh, it, <clears throat> the information will again be on display after the lecture and at 11 o'clock and registration is open till uh, 12 o'clock. Also, just as uh, some other house rules, is please to mute your mics uh, and videos because it is quite a disturbance for the speaker. Um, also, uh, as we have a large number of professional and alumni in this series, um, I've taken the liberty to inform all that uh, re registration for the Masters of Urban Design is also open. Um, this MUD program is convened by myself and offers an additional vehicle of growth to those vested and interested in the development of our built environments. So please follow the links and um, we look forward to hearing from you. Then coming to Mpeti, Mpeti is the founder and owner of MMM, MMA uh, Studio, um, an international award-winning architecture practice based in Joburg. Um, and has with a number of universities, both abroad and locally. Mpeti also has lectured widely internationally, uh, has been part of numerous exhibitions, uh, including curating the South African Architecture Exhibition at the Venice Biennale, and he has acted as juror on many international competitions. Um, he started his practice in 1995 and has since produced a diverse body of work, has won national and international awards, and delivered projects that have set set out to define and celebrate the new South Africa and its people. Among uh, the practice completed projects are the uh, National Memorial Place at Freedom Park in Pretoria, uh, South African embassies in Berlin and Addis Ababa, and the African Leadership Academy uh, Learning Commons in Joburg, just to name but a few. Uh, Petty's commitment to architecture has also been clearly demonstrated here at WITS. We has over the years been a major contributor to our School of Architecture, and he has always been willing to assist, provide input and guidance to students and us as academics alike. And it's with a great sense of gratitude and thanks from us all here that I um, hand over to you, Mpeti. Thank you. I think we'll unshare, and then I think you can then share your screen. Over to you, Mpeti. You need to unmute. Uh, need to un yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Or well, we can, rather. Okay, thank you. I must say this is a very strange um, way of 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 presenting. Um, I'm used to presenting in front of huge crowds of people, and actually, this is more scary uh, because you're kind of presenting to go. If you don't see the people opening their eyes and reacting to reaction, so you'll bear with me a little bit if I uh, seem to be rambling a little bit. 
Um, okay, so I titled this talk Concepts and Concept on Contexts. Uh, and of course, it's 2020, the, the year that we're in right now. Um, and I entitled it Concepts and Context because I think, and what I've been trying to do in my practice over these years is really look at how we can deal with a much more contextually based architecture, um, particularly within this context of South Africa and Africa. Um, because we know that our history of architecture in this in this part of the world is has followed a different trajectory and therefore understanding what the history of of our architecture means and is is quite a, a different journey to the kind of classic canon that you get elsewhere in the world. Um, so I start off with um, a quotation from what we call an organic intellectual who we were working with when working on this project at Freedom Park, um, and who was instrumental in a lot of the kind of anthropological inputs that went into the project. And he says, um, when talking about the invisibility of, of, of African architecture, and, and that if you dig and dig and dig, you will find me. And that's all he left us with. Um, and so, really, it's been a journey of digging. Um, and it's really been a journey of trying to understand at the basics what this thing of architecture is, um, whether architecture needs uh, people, and whether architecture is only about creating shelter. Um, and there's something about um, a non-material culture one that doesn't have kind of obvious remnants of, of architecture that make us look at it back, going back to kind of first principles of architecture. This is a, a the piece again at, at Freedom Park, which is really a, a memorial piece um, made up of rocks and soil, which have been brought from different parts of the country. Um, the soil that's been brought in um, come from different parts of the African continent. And that soil has been mixed into the concrete. Um, and coming from places where, where people were in the liberation struggle and in other struggles over the various conflicts in South Africa died. So in a sense, it was a question of bringing their spirits back by bringing back the soil where they perished and actually embedding it into, into the architecture. And this kind of starts to talk about a concept of architecture that, that relates to, to two things. One is whether the body can be construed as a piece of architecture and that we can make architecture through our bodies. Um, when we talk about dance, we talk about dance formations. In other words, there's a certain sense of making form through the disciplined body. And this is an interesting way of conceiving of architecture. Uh, kind of a temporal architect. Um, and further in this journey of digging and digging, um, last year there was a, an announcement by the Department of Archaeology at WITS on a discovery through LIDAR technology, which is kind of a, a laser, aerial laser technology, of a an ancient Zwana settlement um, not far from here. Um, in an area known as Quening, or what is the Sacred Boss Rand Hills, um, which is a remnant of a what you could call a city, um, which is about 200, between 200, 300 years ago, existed on these hills. And it's only, its footprint has only been able to, they've only been able to discover it through the kind of modern technology that we have. Um, so in a sense, that thing about if you dig and dig and dig, you will find me. Um, the technology now has been able to dig and dig and find that these hills that we see now are empty and which are subject of a conflict over ownership um, actually contain a lot of the history of architecture. And I'd encourage people to look at the work of Karim Sadr, who's at, at the Department of Geography, 
who is looking at um, the archaeology of, of settlements, traditional settlements around this, this area. Again, if we dig and dig and dig, we go back to uh, the cradle of humankind, which again is not very far from us here. Uh, we are quite privileged, I think, to be residing very close to where it was part of the places where everything happened. And in a sense, this is the landscape where we say the birthplace of, of, of consciousness and inevitably of art happened. Um, when I first went there for a project, uh, I was quite disappointed because I thought the cradle of humankind would would be evident in some way in the in the landscape, and yet it's quite a, a normal kind of farmland. Um, nothing that jumps out at you to say this is where humanity was evolved from. Um, but it, it it presents an interesting idea: the idea that um, this is where human beings kind of first became conscious. Um, and once they became conscious of themselves, then it's the birthplace of art as well. And that if we were to dig back to the origins of what we're doing, which is um, creating inhabitation for human beings, maybe we need to go back to the origins. So in, in a couple of years ago, we had a, a, a workshop uh, run by, um, sorry, your screen is, run by Elena Rochi and Dieter Brandt, um, which took us back to the idea of drawing on origins. Um, the idea that the, the, the origins of architecture are through drawing um, and the origins of, of humanity are in the cradle of humankind. Um, and there's this sense that to go back to origins, you're kind of digging down, um, starting from a kind of above ground, which is deals with spirituality, a ground level, which deals with uh, culture, and a below ground, which deals with history. Um, and that because we are all um, impacted by gravity, on the left, you'll see a kind of a section through myself. Um, with the knees, the head, the, the points that, that ground you. Um, maybe it's a way of us reconnecting with, with, with the ground in a more kind of embodied understanding of, of, of architecture. And so imagining um, a world where, a pre-cognitive world, in other words, a world where we, we feel more than we think. What would an architecture come be like that? that comes out of that kind of process. So we, we were trying to look at um, developing forms and a sense of perception that does not include the eyes. Um, I think our society, we say it's ocular centric at the moment. In other words, um, since we started reading, we, we've privileged the eyes over all the other senses. And we've lost the ability to see through what Yohani Palasma calls, see through the skin. Um, and yet, as we talk, we'll see again that um, that loss of an, an embodied practice is, is, is really has taken us to a place where we kind of need to retrace our steps. Um, so this was really just an experiment in, in trying to see if you kind of design without your eyes for a moment. How could you develop sketches? And out of that, how could you then develop a sense of an architecture which you would imagine a precognitive human being would, would, would experience the world. And if you put those together, it was a, a workshop with about 12 people. We all put our, our sketches together to create this invisible city that exists below us. Um, and one can begin to imagine that uh, below the surface, our history looks more like this. And um, this is the way our bodies um, kind of respond to to the environment in a precognitive state. So this is, um, I recently did a, an experiment. I took 20 years of drawing, having been interested in this idea of drawing and the importance of it in, in communicating both with yourself and with, with, with others um, and in thinking. And this is 20 years worth of sketches from sketchbooks which I've, I've kind of 
correlated and I'm beginning to mind in some way. Of course, in architecture and how that hand eye coordination has evolved over time. Another important aspect of the work at Freedom Park, which is also related to the work that uh, Dr. Schaba does, Mabe at, at VIDS, is looking at also um, the Khoisan um, use of ritual in architecture and in what we call reconstructing boundaries of self. Um, ritual is a, another important aspect of uh, creating architecture um, because through that way it's said that you are reconnecting yourself to your environment and becoming one with it. Um, and so the, the elements that make up the ritual, whether it's the, the choice of location, it's the choice of um, the types of musics and chants, etc., all form this this all enveloping uh, environment. Um, that kind of recon that boundary of self gets gets um, blurred in a sense during these processes. And this idea of ritual um, and its relationship to the environment um, is really bound in the the kind of an animist, animistic view of the world. Animism basically means um, where we imbue inanimate objects with a certain spirituality and character of their own. Um, so the rocks, the cliffs, the mountains, these are not just inanimate objects, but these have a life force of their own. And it's this resonance with this life force that we try to instill in, in even in our students when we talk about analyzing a site. Uh, beyond the kind of physical characteristics. Um, so the first pieces of architecture really was recognizing place and being attached to a place through inscribing, you know, marks and, and sketches. Um, and that, for me, is already a beginning of, of the human hand on the environment, which in a sense is, is the digging into architecture. Um, so that, that, that process, the 10-year process working with traditional healers, uh, working with archaeologists um, kind of brought out the sense of the our context uh, and our relationships to 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 the environment and the world of of architecture. So recently, I was I was very pleasantly surprised when I came across this book, um, "Mind in Architecture: Neuroscience Embodiment and the Future of Design." Not only the past, but the future of design. Uh, which is edited by Sarah Robinson and Johanny Palasm. Um, and in this book, they, they talk about the world of art and architecture as being fundamentally an animistic world, awakened to life by our intuitions and feelings. And what's interesting is that the with the kind of modern technologies that are able to measure our new, new, neuro, neuro system, um, we are being able to measure people's emotive responses to environments. Um, and hence that idea that environments do, um, that we react bodily to environments, um, as has been demonstrated in the previous uh, kind of work, is now, um, we're able to now scientifically kind of um, understand how that works. So I would encourage uh, everybody to to read this book. It's, for me, it's it's quite a seminal book in, in in phenomenology, but looking forward into where we are going to in the future. Within this uh, book, the philosopher Mark Johnson talks about um, environmental psychology and. Uh, what the forces that act on our bodies and make us to react emotionally, being things like containment, the sense of, of being contained in space, verticality, how gravity works on us, balance when we're on balance and off balance, uh, the forces that work on us and also that we experience architecture primarily through motion. I won't go into much detail, but th these are things that kind of help in in, in, in design um, 
and understanding how as human beings and human bodies we react to to spaces so once again um these were kind of brought to play in in, in this project in freedom park where you're dealing with the idea of um, the mountain as the monument um and the importance of prospect the the, the opposite conditions of prospect and refuge are fundamentally what human beings navigate between, a sensibility between the idea of prospect, being able to see far away, which gives you a sense of freedom, and refuge, the idea of being enclosed, which again gives you a sense of safety. And basically we are navigating between these two conditions all the time. Um, and I think it was Colin St. John Wilson who says that if you can achieve a sense of both in your architecture, that's when you get the architecture lift itself out of being ordinary, the sense that you, you get a sense of prospect and freedom and exhilaration, but at the same time, um, a sense of security and refuge. So when you look at this mountain and you see the distance and you imagine the universe, and yet within it, there are these places of refuge, the places of, of holding memory. We're kind of working with that idea of, of prospect and refuge. Um, and that the idea of prospect can be enhanced through the ways that you choose to to elaborate this relationship between sky and, and ground um, so that people get a sense of the architecture almost flirting with the sky, if you like. Um, and also through through finding traditional forms of, of celebration on the right is the annual reed dance, um, which is, talks about renewal and this relationship with um, the passing of seasons. So again, it's, it's trying to ground ourselves back into our environment in a very uh, kind of primordial way. The, the idea of, of, of the rocks that we inhabit um, and are the source of, of life. I think in Sesotho, we believe that the, the first human beings came out from under the rock. And there's a crack that goes up the whole side of the continent of Africa, uh, the Rift Valley, which starts kind of around Johannesburg and, and rises up through to Ethiopia. And um, this is basically where human beings emerged along this crack um, from Ethiopia down to here. And so there's this, this, this strength in, in the rock, in the, believing, in the belief that there is another world that exists within. Um, and again, at Freedom Park, it's a play on, on the idea that our memories uh, reside in the rock. Um, so we can use metaphor in this instant um, to, to, to develop an architecture that comes out of our own, our own folklore, our own myths, our own um, storytelling. So this, this had quite an influence on me, this, this whole idea that um, we have our own canon of architecture, if you like, um, that is kind of embedded in the geology of place and the geography of place. Um, and that if you look at how rocks are cracked naturally and how life emerges from those rocks, whether it be animal life or plant life, uh, and eventually human life as well, could we recreate that in in the kind of architecture that, that we're developing, a kind of regrounding. So on the right is a, a proposition, a proposal we, we did for a hotel in, in, uh, in Maruping, um, which again kind of tries to recreate the sense of an eroded piece of, of, of granite uh, that one can inhabit. And that gives you both the idea of, of shelter, but prospect through this long over kind of overarching views to the distance. And that should we develop, again, these were the some of the rooms that we were proposing to almost feel as if they're sunken and, and inserted within a ledge that has been cracked open in the earth. So again, it, it's working with geological formations. Um, and in this house we recently did, there was an opportunity to, to experiment with some of, of those ideas. Um, I think this house is kind of looking, it's ne next to Zoo Lake overlooking the lake and looking back to the West Cliff. 
so it's it's in Joburg one of those sites which has a, a, a long view, which not a lot of, of sites have. Um, and the idea that this building could imagine itself as a, a rocky outcrop that has been eroded and allows you to inhabit it, um, giving you both shelter and, and prospect at the same time. And that contextually it works to fit within its environment uh, so that the building next door in a similar way, it, it works to work with the building to create a, a continuous and contiguous experience. Because the site was, was trapezoidal, a thin narrow site with north uh, to the right and views to the south to the left, it, the, the gymnastics of, of contorting the forms really were about um, maximizing on, on light and sun um, and views at the same time and dealing with the slope of the hill. Um, so that, that uh, trapezoidal form meant that we had to kind of crack the building open to deal with the geometries of the site and that is how light is let in through those, those various cracks in, in the plan. So if you see the plan, it's a basic courtyard uh, building. Um, to the right here would be the views out to the south um, and over the, the hill to the west cliff and then the sun coming in on the north. And basically it's a simple um, village, which if you like, of a central kitchen that opens onto the, the main living court and then two wings of, of, of accommodation on each side. And you can see that this game that's been played with the with the geometry to deal with the, the trapezoidal um, site, which then op offers opportunities for for interesting dynamics in in the architecture. Um, because of the slope, a lot of um, design is done through the section, and the opportunities of rising and falling up and down the hill, and that relationship to to light in the same way that when you descend into a cave or when you emerge from a cave you kind of emerge into the light um, so this is the way the house kind of imagines itself as a as a rock outcrop sitting on the edge as if the soil has been eroded um, and creating inhabitation within um, you can see on this on, on the right there the the distant uh, hills um, but on the left, then it, it creates the intimate sense of, of, of shelter. That's a view at night. Again, the two wings which both rise up um, to the light. And this cracking open of, 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 the, of the architecture, which allows light in from different sides and different angles. So you're always aware of the seasons in the way that the light moves around um, the building. In summer, it's different. In winter, it's different. Um, so there's almost this kind of choreography of light and an idea that you're, 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 you're again, peering in or peering out from, from the cracks. And this theme of rising up, whenever you're rising, you're rising up to the light. So if you're rising out of a cave, you kind of are being drawn by light to, 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 a, to come out of, of, of the space. Again, in Stirkfontein Caves, because there was a lot of mining inside the caves for limestone, etc. The, the, the infrastructure, the industrial infrastructure of, of how people rose up and down um, has also kind of been brought into, into the design. Um, and the, 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 the play on light and how light, um, as I said, in winter and summer, um, act on the building and how you enhance that through these portals, for example. So that was um, an opportunity, as I say, to, to develop spatial ideas around how we inhabit um, our history of architecture uh, and and how South Africa came to be being through through primarily through geography and geology. Um, so now I'll go a little bit into the next project, um, 
which is a series of educational projects. Um, looking at the time, 10.30, wow. Okay. Um, relax. Um, relax. Um, <laughs> All right, thanks. So with, with Baha'u'llah, the, the, the founder of the Baha'i faith, says that education is like mining human beings. Human beings are, are mines with all these treasures, and it's education that, that digs out these, these treasures. Um, and, and, and when we design buildings for education, I think it's, it's important that we consider things like that. Um, also, another thing, I forget who it is, is that socialization is at the heart of learning. The way that we engage with one another to share experiences or knowledge is key. And this is uh, fundamental to the way we, we learn uh, this kind of peer-to-peer -peer education. Um, and again, once we design buildings, we need to understand um, the fundamentalness of that. So the first project, which um, we again allowed us to, to look at the, the kind of pedagogy in education was the African Leadership Academy project. This is the school for African leaders just outside Johannesburg in Honeydew, um, along the Bears Nodier just off it. Um, it's a school that used to belong to the, the Printing Academy, um, and it used to train people in, in printing. Um, the school is sets itself out to redef redefine expectations. Africa's future will be shaped by young people who commit each day to think differently, to break boundaries and to do hard things. Um, so it had quite a, a strong geometry in the campus existing, um, but they had for a long time been using existing almost factory-like buildings for the school. And the building on the right, which used to be a, a printing press, we were asked to change that into what they call a learning commons. Um, so we had, because they have a unique um, curriculum, um, which is more about leadership and entrepreneurship on the African continent, it gave us a chance to really go try and delve deeply into the, the pedagogy of their teaching methods and see how that would then elaborate itself in, in architecture. Um, so the building before we, we got it, they had inhabited it as a library. Uh, this massive 3,000 square meter shed um, with very little light or natural air. You can see on the top right, some of the classrooms were just added with uh, partition boards, um, but it was a very um, depressing space. Um, so in our um, work, the first step was to look at campus-wide uh, redevelopment. This is the building here. This is the kind of circle that ties all these buildings together. And they looked, were looking at a 10-year expansion plan, which meant that we had to look at how the campus would be expanded, um, which was, again, trying to see how we could then inhabit spaces away from, from this ring. Um, and then the, the big shed, which you see over here, most important in the kind of campus strategy, was to break it up so that the the roots around were not uh, too circuitous, and you have to like wrap, walk all the way around the perimeter to get to the different spaces. So that already set up um, a way of working with this large space. Um, and then we worked with the teachers who told us a little bit about their their teaching methods. I won't go too much into them, but the kind of pedagogy of constructivism, which is working with students' prior experiences, students coming from all over the continent. They work a lot with problem-solving methods, um, reflective, contemplative methods, um, integrative and collaborative. A lot of what we do in architecture, people are beginning to realize the, the way we teach, the kind of studio-based teaching, is actually how people are moving towards what they imagine a new way of, of learning, uh, which is kind of studio-based um, and so what we did was to take the big form. Um, first thing was the idea of subtraction. We took out the big, a big space in the middle to make a courtyard. Um, and then out of that was it, the additions of more intimate spaces 
formal intimate spaces, which you can see in the gray. Um, and then looked at the spaces in between as, as kind of the spaces for, for more informal kind of interaction. And by playing this kind of game of Rub Rubik Cube almost, we, we were able to discuss with the teachers how they would use these spaces in, in terms of the different ways of, of learning and how this building then links to other spaces on the campus through the kind of permeabilities um, and, and new opportunities for circulating. At this point, there's supposed to be a, a little movie that happens, but I'll, I'll continue. OK, so the first move was to take off this roof. If you imagine the space I showed previously, this was all roofed. Um, so as soon as you take off the roof and create this courtyard, it completely changed um, the environment. Um, the second move was an insertion of of a, a mezzanine um, on the side that uh, has not been the roof has not been taken off, um, and then to create this relationship between that mezzanine, which becomes a library, and and the courtyard um, through different levels of of, of transparency. Um, What's very big for the school is that they um, they're big on transparency and the sense of of unity of purpose. So all the rooms, all the classrooms you'll see are, are transparent. Everybody can see what everybody's doing. You can see what lessons are going on, who's doing what kind of work, rather than these kind of closed off of spaces. And then internally working with the the big volume was to insert a a mezzanine and then to have these small boxes, which are, are, are small, more intimate spaces that get inserted into this large space. And that created a kind of a diversity of, of, of spaces that the students can, can find themselves in. Um, so in the attic spaces, again, you have uh, more intimate spaces um, that overlook the big space. So again, you can see this thing, the idea of being of being sheltered and having refuge, but also having the opportunity of overlooking another space. And then just the ways we 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 created hints of of the new into the old. So the old is the brick and the kind of green roofs, and the new are these insurgents that that suggest that the building has got a new life beyond it. And what's interesting all the time is how students and how the users actually take to your building. For me, this is the most exciting time of a project because sometimes it's, it happens in unintended or unexpected ways. So this is uh, an, on opening day how the different spaces were being used by, by the students. The next project, um, is the Witz Mathematical Sciences building on our West Campus. Um, a building that through contortions, etc., became the game became almost like working with a, 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 a Maiba strip, which is a mathematical idea of, of infinity. Um, this building obviously brought all the math departments into one location on West Campus. Um, so we were again looking for an idea fundamental to mathematics that we could use to, to help us elaborate the building. Um, obviously it works with the, the framework for the campus, for West Campus. Um, you can see on the left the, 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 the Witz uh, framework, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And the idea that the East and West campuses have these two social hearts. Um, and that whatever we, we did, it was important to reinforce this. Um, what we did on in developing the design is really to look at the texture of the campus. So we did a photographic kind of survey of all the buildings on, on campus to try and see if, if something jumps out at us in terms of the use of materials, uh, the kind of textures we find on campus, etc. Um, I'll try and go a bit quicker, but historically this um, sports stadium, the skiing stadium, kind of occupied this footprint and uh, over time it had developed um, the science block, which had been developed um, on the west side and the southern side, 
um, the north side, which had all the, the historical grandstand, and then the east side, which is where we're developing. Um, so on the top left, you see some of the diagrams which uh, developed um, how the site was. Important is to kind of create a continuity on the campus and that your building really is the result of what the spaces around it need to be. Um, so the on the left is permeability, the areas that we needed to to continue these major routes through the campus from east to west, north to south, and how you can make a space contiguous with what is already existing, and that your building then consorts itself to to suit that. On on the right is a historical building which we have to maintain, um, and therefore. To respect that, we create a forecourt and, and allow allow this historical building to, to present itself. Um, the use of models in, in, a, in, a, in a context where you're working quite closely with existing architecture to create this idea of contiguous spaces. Um, so important here in the model, you can see how this, the stadium um, kind of beckons back to the East Campus by dropping the, the volumes and lifting the, vol the, the volumes on either end to kind of bookend the space. And then working with uh, recreating a circular volume without being circular, um, because circles are difficult to, to fit program into. Um, but one can recreate the sense of, of the circular through the, through the way that, that the architecture, the forms kind of uh, splay out. Um, and you can see on the right here the exact kind of precise linking of lines from one building to the next, to our building. Um, so it, trying to quite carefully fit in within the, the context and create a sense of a continuous space. Um, on the top right, you see diagrams of hard and soft edges. Again, looking at where the hard and soft edges of the adjacent buildings are and, and continuing that as, as an idea. Um, on the bottom right, you'll see how that then sets up a program where we say that the kind of public function should inhabit the street and uh, reinforce the idea of publicness onto this big square. So there's a there's a kind of a logic and a ma almost a mathematical logic that follows in how you the forms get um, get get developed out of out of the constraints of the site and and the desires of the program. And that contortion again, you kind of talks to this idea of a continuous uh, surface that that Mobius strip, um, which again tries to recreate the sense of 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 the circle and the curve, but allowing the program to happen. And then, of course, dealing with um, the program of offices versus teaching spaces, the the orientation towards the west and how you deal with light, etc. And um, scale, linking scale to adjacent buildings, uh, materials, talking about a continuity of materials. Um, again, working with, with, with your, your immediate context to create a continuity, which I think is critical for campuses. And then reinforcing on the ground floor that, that kind of social, um, social condenser, if you like. So again, looking from the south, you and kind of see how the building tries to wrap around and, and bookend this the side of the 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 square um, but still maintaining the scale of of the adjacent buildings and then the idea of permeability and gateways um, you saw in the that previous diagram around permeability that there's a strong desire line to move through into the square from from the east and that the building then lifts itself to allow, to form a gateway into that space. And that gateway then has these overlooking spaces, which are the main staff rooms and circulation routes through the building. Um, just again, to reinforce the sense that you are, you are arriving at a threshold between one side and, and, and the next side. Um, how are we doing for time? Um, 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 quite fascinating. Quite so fascinating. Keep, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, these are other views of 
of again the idea of creating thresholds. And the eventual build up of the buildings. There are three components. The third one hasn't been built on the south side, which was going to be a library, um, but it has been enabled should that happen in the future. On the top right, you see the kind of relationship with the Tower of Light, which is this um, quite unique feature in, in, in Johannesburg um, that you want to kind of project lines towards it. This is the next project. I think these slides came out a bit blurred when I checked this morning. Um, so I'll see how, how far we can get with this. This is the the, the building in at the Salt Lake University in, in Kimberley. Um, as you know, that the, the university has a very um, tight and organized um, urban design framework that is quite prescriptive in terms of build to lines, um, heights, features on your building. Um, and you can see if you've seen, I'm sure you've, you've, you've seen stuff on the campus that it is actually beginning to create uh, what in Kimberley is a very unique environment. Um, and people are asking about why are all these buildings talking to each other in the same way. Um, so again, you see that the, the value in, in developing a kind of an urban design uh, response, particularly on, on, on campuses where the spaces between buildings are more important almost than the buildings themselves. Our building, um, which is the School of Applied Sciences, is this long building that sits along a major spine of the campus. Um, just to the, to the right of it is, is the library, which is kind of a landmark building. And then there are other buildings which make up a square in front of, in front of that building. Um, this was an interesting drawing, uh, which someone put, I, I asked someone to put together all the plans we could get off of the campus. Uh, this, this long one is, is the building that we've been working on. Um, these are some of the, the other buildings on the campus and this is kind of a land surveyor's drawing, but it almost feels when you add these plans that you've kind of excavated, um, an archaeological ruin. You can imagine a thousand years from now, if someone was to 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 unearth this, these buildings, the ruins of these buildings, would they recognize the pattern? And I think you can. I think if you look at, uh, it could be an interesting exercise to to kind of recognize the open versus closed spaces at in the plan, the kind of morphology of 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 what's being developed. Um, but for us, as I said, the important aspect of this project was the this route that passed uh, to the east of the building, uh, north is to your right. Um, and the fact that we had to then in, um, work with huge spaces, 320-seater auditoriums um, and 80-seater classrooms and lecture theatres. So basically, given a very tight um, envelope with which you can work, and having very large spaces, um, there's not a lot of a lot of room to maneuver. Um, so the most important thing was uh, developing a way to be most efficient with the use of space, and creating a a contiguous urban um, and social space throughout the building. Um, these were some of the sketches that that we started looking at. Primarily, the articulation on on this public edge. Uh, with those last large spaces. On the right, at one point, we're looking at trying to express the large auditoriums in a very overt way. Um, so that again, you're working with ideas that you can see peer into the cracks of this, this, this geological formation. Um, so the building basically has these two large auditoriums which bookend because that's the only places they could fit. Um, which face in, in different di directions, they kind of lift themselves up to form a continuous undercover walkway. 
Um, and then related to that is the most the biggest spaces at the bottom where most people will be using the spaces and then going up with the spaces get more intimate and more private. But what is important is the continuity of the yellow space uh, because that's kind of the, the social life of, of the building. And this is where the real learning happens beyond the kind of formal of, of the classrooms. So again, the, the yellow spaces which overlook each other um, and kind of create the life of the building within this, this very orthogonal and, 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 and strict geometry. And then the private, smaller, intimate spaces of, of staff rooms at the top, which also create their own kind of social space um, of, of ideas around staff interaction and different departments being able to, to interact with each other. So the, the important um, route, which I was talking about, comes down past the building in, in, in the front here. Um, it kind of allows the overhanging of the building required by the, the, the program allowed us to create a sheltered walk that goes through. Um, but that this, these heights relate directly to the heights of the building adjacent to it. But as we come to the square, then the height of the, the walkway rises and it kind of opens up to the square. So we're trying to almost as if the square gets extended into the building. Um, and this rise here is, is actually a staircase internally that if you are, which has become a seating stair, that if you're sitting there, you can actually see people walking down this major route from the north campus to, to the south. So it becomes a, a, a place in the life of, of the campus where I imagine people love to sit and, 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 and watch the, the life go by. This is another view again of the relationship between that walkway and the social spaces that happen internally. For us, it was important that, that we try and be transparent when education has been, you know, a lot of people have been deprived of, especially tertiary education. Um, their curiosity is sparked by being able to see into buildings and see what people are doing. Um, so that relationship wherever possible is, is what we've been trying to exploit. Um, so some of the the sketches you can see this on the left top is the kind of main staircase which looks over the the main walkway through the campus and imagining spaces where people would linger um, so even the way we've designed the circulation route is not direct but you have to go up and go around and go up so that you experience what's happening in the building purposefully rather than the quickest route that goes up and up and down. I think this is a repeat of the slide. These were some of the, the earlier images. Uh, on the left, you'll see these were how we were trying to link this building to the building next door. So the, the, the kind of preciseness of the line where one building stops and where your building uh, starts and how you open up um, a space exactly where the next building opens. So in a sense, you can, you're can you carving out the public space through your building and through relating back to what, what the other buildings are doing. Um, this is a, where we are in terms of construction. Um, I think it should be finished in the next couple of months. But um, I thought this, this slide was interesting because you're beginning to see that kind of layering of space from the big open square on the outside, the kind of double volume um, foyer space with opportunities for overlooking in the staircases, and then the more intimate um, sheltered and protected um, spaces for individual study. Um, so again, we're working with the idea of, of containment and um, openness. Um, And then, so on the left here would be the, the classrooms. Just outside the classrooms are the kind of study nooks. Um, and then beyond that, you can overlook um, the main lobby space below. And then beyond that is the main circulation spine. 
So again, we're creating a, a clear hierarchy from outside to inside to more intimate. Um, and that, that hierarchy works also in terms of verticality. Um, yeah, I think I could stop there or I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, wish, I, think, yeah, I think let's stop it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, hardly rambling, um, Katie. Um, and I think it's um, there's nothing. Um, there was nothing said that had a good place, um, and it really embodies uh, much wisdom. Um, Thank and you. The inspiration of the architecture. Uh, which is sort of embedded in the geology of place and all the symbolic attributes, um, I think are, are, are fantastic. And I think um, give us a, an understanding as to um, the idea of place being sort of the essential informant um, to, to a spatial response. And I think that as a methodology and approach, I think is something students and, and um, professionals alike would, would probably find uh, uh, very, very uh, inspirational. Um, maybe uh, we always open it up for some discussions uh, and some um, uh, questions. Um, and maybe I'll just start off, um, maybe just uh, we've ended. Uh, so given your substantial involvement uh, in university and higher education architecture, um, and also given this, the sudden shift in learning and teaching methodologies and sort of the dependency suddenly on, 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 on technology to, to allow that exchange still to be fostered in some way or another. Um, everyone keeps on speaking about a new normal, uh, but no, no sort of clear markers have been placed regarding you know, the spatial implications and the, the impact on the architecture as we go forward. And maybe uh, given your your experience, maybe some thoughts on that. Um, I think, um, and I was going to try and show in, in the next couple of slides, a, an architecture that is more open, open to sky, if you like, or open-ended. So should um, we just do that? Why don't you share it and then you can answer that way. Very quickly. Am I sharing? Uh, yes. Okay, so I was going to go through another elaboration of, of, of sense of place, this time in 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 the Okava in Maung in the Okavango, where we did a competition for an airport. Um, and the idea that does an airport have to be a hermetically sealed environment? Can it just be provide sufficient shelter? Um, because you don't have the kind of climate that needs us to be sealed. Um, can you can you create that kind of open air, um, highly ventilated environment? Um, I think this is a project in Burundi, which I'm trying to find the best. Again, the kind of spaces which, again, if the climate allows us, we don't have to have completely sealed um, spaces, but we create the minimum required for shelter. Um, that may be because it's said that we have a kind of a less opportunity for transmission of, of, of airborne diseases through when you have much more open air and, and transparent spaces, it means that maybe our relationship to to what we consider to be inside and outside would be would be different, and that they might be opportunities for thinking more about. I was going to go through uh, through working a lot with um, less enclosed spaces. Um, so really rethinking uh, what is, when do we need to have absolutely have totally enclosed spaces and when can we have uh, the minimal shelter that, that is required. It's also a question about resources that as we have less and less resources, maybe the way we build has to be more elemental. Um, so that's, that was kind of my 
immediate sense. Um, beyond that, because I still think, and having taught now halfway through the pandemic, and having to have stopped the person-to-person -person teaching, there are elements I feel that still need that that kind of immediate person-to-personness, uh, -person especially in in the creative industries. I'm not sure if. I think no, no thanks, uh, Katie. I'm going to open up for some questions. Um, I know that not all can show their hands or have the ability to show hands. So let's maybe start with a show of hands of those who want to maybe ask a question, some of the students possibly. We find that they are very shy um, because of the Even number. If we, don't, of their... we don't see them. <laughs> Saskia, please go for it. Okay. I'll I'll just go ahead. Um, hi, nice to listen to your presentation. It was actually really, really informative. Um, I have a few questions about the science building that you did on WITS campus. Um, our current project that we're doing is on, it's an educational building developed on the East campus. So I'm very interested in how you, um, picked up your textural materiality um like site specific i guess ideas behind the building which i thought were really interesting especially because um texturally Witt's campus has this kind of uniform concrete solid kind of um i don't really know what the word is but <laughs> um it's very evident throughout campus and i think it's something that yeah, there we go. I, I only see the picture changed now. Um, this very solid, concrete, dark, kind of flat language that the campus seems to carry on both east and west. So um, why did you choose to, or at least how did you choose to incorporate that in a way that reflects the newer side of design and architecture and kind of bring something interesting into the already... I mean, existing campus textures. <laughs> Sorry, terribly worded question, but at least it was a question. I think um, if you look at the the buildings on campus, you can kind of see history in that although they might kind of all look the same at some point, if you look more closely, you'll start to see buildings from different periods in history. Um, and if you try and go back and, and understand that history, you'll see that, you know, Witz is almost 100 years old and that neoclassical architecture of the Great Hall, etc., came out of a particular time and, and, and period when the world was kind of going through some imperial notions. Um, then you get the buildings that were built um, kind of in the mid-60s. So I think if you if you follow the understand the buildings in terms of their historical context. Um, on the West Campus, that used to be the main showground um, where people, you know, people would like where the, the Rand Easter show is in Nazrek. Um, and historically what what Empire was showing um, as their their kind of achievements is why that tower is then built as this, this kind of achievement to to progress and the future. So I think if you not only look at the textures and uh, colors and materials visually, but also try and understand them historically, maybe there's a story that, that presents a continuum in the sense of where we're going to in the future. Um, so I think with our building, particularly by not making a curve where the where the, the, the urban framework required a curve, but saying a curve is a series of straight lines that can radiate. Um, it's kind of a, a, a modern take on the architecture of the old um, science stadium. Um, so, yeah, I think um, try and, and look beyond. It's interesting to kind of uh, understand the, the textures at a visceral level, but I think then going back to also understand the, the historical context and where we think we're going um, could give you some some clues. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, maybe without uh, going into complete chaos, um, so uh, maybe more questions from a broader field. Uh, without, are there uh, Ariel? Ariella? Hi, I'm Patty. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, am I unmuted? You, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much for the lecture. Um, you were speaking quite a lot about psychogeography in reference to the Freedom Park project. I was just interested to know um, whether you applied these principles to, or how you applied applied these principles in an education context um, with the buildings that you built in both Witz and uh, Solplaiki. Psychogeography. I think the the main application is um, the central ideas around phenomenology and um, the kind of environmental psychology. Um, so the sense that um, although Freedom Park started as a project that was about representation, but it actually worked with uh, a lot of, of phenomenology and, and concepts of, of, of embodiment. Um, and I think the ex Uh, the, the, the design of the environments, the kind of embodied experience of, of the world, as opposed to a virtual world. I think that's how we've, we've kind of tried to, to transfer that knowledge into, into our learning environment. So one would be the diversity of spaces, um, that one can find yourself in a diverse, almost like a building is a landscape, and and people find different places in the landscape that suits them at that particular time, mm -hmm. um, and and that landscape allows for both the idea of refuge, and the idea of of, of prospect of freedom and yet of of safety. Um, so yeah, I think it's 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 still. We're still cooking it, but I think that that's where we're at the moment. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. OK. I am Petey. Um, I think we can close off the session uh, on that score. Thank you again for the most insightful of talks. Uh, and I think Thank that, you. that is a real inspiration to all of us, young and old. And we look forward to further engaging with you on, on numerous levels, both teaching and architecturally and professionally. So, yes, I think from Wits again, uh, a huge thanks of, and gesture of gratitude for all, all you've done and also today. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, and, uh, thanks. Uh, looking, thanks. Looking forward thank to the, seeing you again. All right, thank you so much. Okay, just again to... Uh, to everyone, we'll again share the um, uh, the sort of screenshot with some of the information that you might require to do whatever you need to do in terms of your registration of attendance. And our next lecture um, is uh, the 17th, which is um, next week, uh, Monday, by Craig McLennan, and it's at 10 o'clock. Uh, same place, same time. Thank you. <laughs>